Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 7. No matter what master we serve. Before we begin today's episode, I'll take this opportunity to recommend one of my fellow Agora podcasts, The History of England. David Crowther's podcast is one of my absolute favourites. I've listened for years, and many of you listening now probably heard about me and my podcasts as guest episodes in The Shed. For those of you who haven't listened to The History of England, you are missing out. Beginning with the Anglo-Saxons, David is now at Elizabeth I, so if you're curious about a period I've only briefly alluded to, go have a listen to the History of England podcast. That again is the History of England podcast. Last time we had a narrative episode, we left off on the brink of the first of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. This episode was meant to be on the First Bishop's War, but I started that script with an explanation of why so many Scots were serving as mercenaries in the Thirty Years' War, and why their return to fight for the Covenant, or the King, was vital to the outcome of the conflict. When I'd covered that, I realised that the script was longer than an ordinary episode on its own, and so I've decided to make it a standalone episode and add even more detail. Plus, it meant I got to use this title, which is an added bonus. Mercenaries, or in contemporary parlance, waged men of war, will be an important element in the early years of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. While Charles would agree peace terms with the French and Spanish, these only ended his kingdom's official involvement in the Thirty Years' War. Up until the outbreak of the war at home, and for some even after this, Charles's subjects served in their thousands on every side of the Continental War. This wasn't always by choice. The Scottish Lord of Spiney from Elgin was granted the right to conscript all strong and sturdy beggars and vagabonds, masterless men and idle loiterers, to fight in Europe. Even before the Thirty Years' War broke out, the authorities were quite happy to pack off potential troublemakers to fight foreign wars. If you recall many episodes ago, Lord Deputy Chichester deported 6,000 Gaelic Irish to fight for Sweden, and on his accession, James dispatched 2,000 men from Cumbria to fight for the Dutch. Nevertheless, mercenary work was a popular profession, especially when combined with a religious cause. Exact numbers are naturally impossible to find, but from 1624 until 1637, recruiters were permitted to recruit over 41,000 Scots. It's unlikely that they ever managed to recruit that amount of men, but at least 25,000 would serve in the armies of Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, Russia, and various German princes. To put this into context, this was 10% of the adult male population. Several thousand Scots also fought for the Habsburgs. A similar number of Irish fought for Spain and France. Despite the brutality of early modern warfare, many thousands of Stuart subjects survived their service on the continent. The English and Scots would be recalled as the Bishop's Wars approached, with returning veterans joining the forces of either Charles or the Covenanters. Likewise, once the Irish rebellion erupts, their expatriates will flood back to fight. All of these veterans would bring the latest military advances to the British Isles, which had been, after all, at relative peace for almost half a century. Peace is good for many things, but instilling experience, discipline, and morale in garrison forces was not one of them. These veterans would be highly sought after once fighting breaks out. Though many thousands of English and Irish served during the Thirty Years' War, and would make their own mark on the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, in today's episode we will be focusing mostly on the Scots. Through fighting in the war, these forces acquired the very latest in tactics and strategy. Their commanders would acquire prestige and experience, and many would win positions of high command in German, Swedish, and Austrian militaries. Throughout their service, the Scottish military diaspora would not lose touch with their homeland, and many heard about the developments in the 30s and looked homeward with concern. 
Scots were highly sought after by continental armies, owing to their reputation. One Dutch source describes the Scots as the bulwark of the Republic. A Scottish officer, Colonel Robert Munro, who was garrisoning Stettin on the Baltic coast in 1637, boasted that his Scots died and deserted at a lower rate than their Swedish and German comrades, because they were hardier. A printed German pamphlet, the Stettin Woodcut, shows an image of some Scottish soldiers. The caption describes them as a strong, rugged people, which gets by with little to eat. If they lack bread, they eat roots, or even bugs if necessary. They can run 20 German miles in a single day, and use bows and arrows and long knives as well as muskets. Well, with promotional material like that, no wonder recruiters prized Scots. Naturally, a lot of this was exaggeration. Either the boasts of proud Scots, or the skilled propaganda of their employers. But as we will see in this episode, the Scottish reputation for bravery on the battlefield and hardiness on campaign was based on plenty of examples. But why were so many Scots serving as mercenaries? Now, there were a few possible factors, and they were often interlinked. For starters, there was a long-standing tradition of dispatching soldiers for foreign armies. Long before our period, Scottish armies began serving French kings in their wars against the English, the famous Old Alliance. In our period, the Scots Guard, or Garde Écossaise, remained a valuable, if small, element of the royal bodyguard of France. Famously, Scotland had a distinct class of mercenary called, in English, the Galloglass, from the Irish Gaelic Galloglach, meaning foreign warrior. These soldiers specifically came from the Western Isles and the western coast of the Highlands, a legacy of the incredibly durable bond between Gaeldom and Ireland. While some Galoglach did fight in the Thirty Years' War, mainly for Sweden, the bulk of Scottish mercenaries would not be considered Galoglass. Interestingly, Stephen Murdoch and Alexia Grosjean hypothesise that Alexander Leslie, who we'll see much more of later in the episode and in future episodes, had perhaps served in a Galoglar expedition to Ireland during the Nine Years' War. He was, after all, being fostered by the Campbells of Glenorchy, who had sent Galloglass to fight for Elizabeth. This is all to say that these precedents presented an appealing opportunity for those with limited options in Scotland, especially younger or illegitimate sons of the nobility, who didn't stand to inherit much, if anything. Nobility could expect to be officers in mercenary regiments, especially if they raised them. Further down the social scale, the potential for glory and wealth was just as appealing to ordinary Scots, especially for those either without a profession, an inheritance, or a wealthy patron to aid their careers. In many families, serving as a mercenary became a family tradition. Prestige and loot the two ever-present motivators for men to risk their lives, were naturally a large part of the reason so many Scots willingly signed up to fight abroad. Especially in the borders and highlands, honour in battle was paramount to one's place in society. Steady pay, or at least the promise of steady pay, was enticing, as was the potentially vast wealth that could be found on campaign, usually in other people's houses. We also can't discount wanderlust, the desire for adventure and to see the world, to meet interesting and stimulating people, and to kill them. After the Reformation, a new motivation emerged, to aid their co-religionists in defending the true faith, a motivation which applied to both Scottish Catholics and Presbyterians. However, this was not a firm dividing line. Multiple leading Scottish commanders were Catholic, yet fought against the Habsburgs and for the honour of Elizabeth Stuart. Dynastic loyalty often trumped confessional, with several Scottish officers in Habsburg's service, including the Governor of Michelor, resigning and going over to the Winter Queen's side to fight for her. If you've listened to my interview with Zach Twomley, this won't come as much of a surprise. Zach is quite adamant that seeing the Thirty Years' War as a purely religious conflict of Protestants versus Catholics, is a mistake. 
Just as states were motivated by more secular concerns, so too were the people fighting the war. A less common, though no doubt present, reason for people to sign up was to get away from trouble at home. For those men who found themselves on the losing end of local disputes, which could lead to bloodshed and often did, signing up for a campaign gave them a way out. For those who had fallen afoul of the law, service abroad was one way to escape, and was sometimes offered to those already imprisoned. However, as we'll cover shortly, willing recruits were not in endless supply, even with all of these powerful and common motivators. Another factor which helps explain the popularity of mercenary service with Scots was the Scottish government's tendency to use foreign service almost as a social safety valve. When times were tough, say after a famine or during a drop in trade, mercenary work was often supported by the state. This had been the case for decades, if not centuries, and there are multiple reasons why this might be enticing to the government. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, mercenary work was work. During times of economic hardship, sources of employment disappear. By supporting recruiting officers for foreign wars, military-aged men could find a job, and one that could pay quite well. When they returned from service, if they returned from service, they had, at least in theory, been fed and paid during the intervening period. That was the second reason why the government repeatedly pushed military-aged men into foreign wars. It got them out of the kingdom. Not only were they theoretically fed and paid during their time away, but it prevented large masses of unemployed, restless men who had been raised in a quite militarised society from posing a threat to that society. Left to their own devices, the authorities feared that they would take up banditry or fall into the employ of seditious factions. These fears were not unfounded, and so foreign service acted as a convenient way to get these potential troublemakers out of the picture. Another reason is that encouraging Scots to enlist was a cheap way for Scotland to aid its allies. The Privy Council provided the manpower, and friendly states such as the Dutch Republic, Sweden and Denmark-Norway provided the pay, weaponry and supplies. And hey presto, the cash-strapped Scottish crown could now fulfil its international obligations. However, it's important not to think that all mercenary bands came about at the instigation or with the support of the government. Many were private ventures and countless individuals would have signed up outside of dedicated recruitment drives, without the government necessarily being any the wiser. This, of course, adds to the difficulty in working out exactly how many Scots went abroad to fight. Earlier, I alluded to another factor for explaining why Scotland had such a vast pool of potential recruits. Scotland was, whether lowland, highland, or borders, a highly militarised society. Feuds between families influenced political battles, and these often became very real battles. The borders, or the middle shires as King James preferred they were called, remained a volatile and violent region. The endless, generation-long reaving and cross-border raiding had almost disappeared for the first two decades of the 17th century. With one man as sovereign on both sides of the border, it was no longer really necessary to maintain this low-level warfare between the two kingdoms. That sovereign was particularly keen on ending it entirely, and he had instituted a number of measures to rein in the reavers, and they largely succeeded. However, when these measures were cut or rolled back due to budget constraints, it was revealed how shallow these reforms truly were, and the old ways returned with a vengeance. Naturally, this was... Unfortunate for those looking to live peacefully in the middle shires, but it was fertile ground for the recruiting officers. Highland society was, despite the relative peace brought about under James and Charles, still rife with feuding and raiding. Again, terrible for those looking for a peaceful life, but great for finding skilled killers. The Highland clan system was a huge time saver for recruiters. James Miller, in his chapter, The Scottish Mercenary as a Migrant Labourer in Europe, gives an example of how these conditions worked together. In 1633, the parish minister of Wardlaw, 
near Inverness, recorded that Thomas Fraser, son of a local laird, used his clan connections and the assistance of Lord Lovett, the clan chief, to raise recruits. In another instance involving the Frasers, in 1656, clan leaders helped a recruiter enlist 43 men in three days. It seems that the use of such social networks was standard procedure. When Sir Donald Mackay of strathan issued commissions in his proposed regiment to the leading young men in neighbouring clans, he undoubtedly expected at least some of them to respond with enthusiasm and bring men with them to the colours, and this is indeed what happened. When Mackay's regiment, as it came to be known, was being raised in 1626, the Highlands were a fertile source of recruits, and 2,000 men were ready to sail by October. Recruits from the borders and the Highlands were well versed in campaigning over rough terrain. They were experienced in warfare, and they often had cultural and pragmatic reasons to sign up to fight. However, the bulk of mercenary recruits, at least until the late 1620s and the 1630s, came from the lowlands, with its urban towns and tenant farmers. In Mackay's regiment, 25 of its 30 colonels came from the lowlands, with only 4 from the highlands. The ratio is even starker for lieutenant colonels, where only 6 of the 52 were from the highlands. This is for the officers, but what about the rank and file? Now, of course, the military cultures of the borders and the highlands are famous, but the lowlands was not populated by pacifists. Lowland nobility, no less than their highlander and borders peers, maintained their own armed retinues and were quite prepared to use them. The lowlands also had a system of militia musters, wappenshaws, or weapon showings. These wappenshaws were called on an ad hoc basis, and everyone eligible for military service was meant to attend, and bring whatever weapons they had. In our period, the traditional weaponry of Scottish warriors remained in use. Swords and halberds, of course, but also particular Scottish weapons. The dirk, a short dagger. The taj, a shield from the highlands. Jedburgh staves, Lochaber axes. Even in the age of gunpowder, a skilled archer with a good bow remained a powerful force on the field, and the Scottish bow industry was protected from imported rivals by royal decree. Scottish bows were usually made of yew, strung with hemp, and used birch arrows. However, this was the age of gunpowder, and by this point, firearms were increasingly common. Scottish variations on these weapons were limited, though Scottish gunsmiths may have been behind the snap-ants, though this isn't certain. The Scottish variety of snap ants was a pistol, concealable, made entirely of metal, without a trigger guard, and built with a belt clip. Muskets, or long guns, were becoming more popular, though despite the efforts of the Scottish government, the domestic musket industry remained small. However, imports of these weapons were highly sought after, and the government went out of its way to secure and protect these shipments. At these weapon shores, which were essentially fairs and events in their own right, weapons were practiced with and maintained. The idea was that every able-bodied man would know his way around at least some kind of weapon, in case a militia needed to be formed. It also allowed the authorities to have an idea of what weapons they had at their disposal, and who would be available to wield them. This also meant that when recruiting officers came a-calling, weapons experience at a Wappenshaw was better than no experience at all. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. 
As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com, code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. Despite these factors explaining why Scotland was such a fertile kingdom for military recruits, there was a limit to how welcome that recruitment was. As the 1630s progressed, resistance to recruitment drives grew, and the numbers of willing men dropped, even in the Highlands. Whenever a levy was issued, and recruiting officers spread throughout the kingdom, complaints soon followed. For example, Edinburgh's burgesses complained that their sons were being poached from the university by particularly charismatic recruiters. Recruiters, especially if they were having trouble meeting their quotas, could be quite prepared to just Shanghai men off the streets, pressing them into involuntary service. Eventually, the Privy Council ordered recruiting officers to work without the usual drums and spectacle. Where before this had been an effective way to, literally, drum up recruits, increasingly it instead brought angry citizens down on the heads of the officers. More and more, those left behind resented their brothers, sons, tenants and servants being persuaded or forced into service, especially if they never came back. An officer from Mackay's regiment, struggling to find reinforcements in 1636, physically assaulted tenants of the Gordons after they refused to let him take their sons. Even those voluntarily recruited were liable to take their enlistment bonus and run. These deserters and those who helped them faced severe punishments. A common refuge for deserters was Ireland, and the Privy Council repeatedly reminded boat captains not to aid them in their flight. At times, those fleeing the recruiters banded together, taking up their own arms to fight for their right not to have to fight. The Privy Council even ordered preemptive arrests of potential recruits from among vagrants and men without masters before the recruiting officers arrived, even once a force was safely recruited, until it actually sailed to the continent, it remained a dangerous nuisance. For example, town authorities in Burnt Island complained about the many great disorders caused by the mustard soldiery. But why were recruiting officers so determined to make their quotas, to the point that they would kidnap people? Naturally, they had responsibilities to keep with their superiors and to their employers. In 1627, a muster was ordered to provide men to serve with the King of Denmark-Norway, Christian IV, against the Emperor. Three commanders were given £4,000 each, and were meant to find 3,000 men apiece. One of these commanders was Lord Spiney, who we mentioned earlier was given the right to conscript men off the street if they had no work, were masterless, or were, in the language of the time, Egyptians by which they mean Romany. Spiney was not the only recruiter struggling to find men. One of his compatriots, James Sinclair, Baron Merkel, had still not met his quota by 1629, and the £4,000 had been spent along with much of his own fortune. He petitioned the Privy Council for aid, and also to plead his case to Charles. Not to get the English king's forgiveness, per se, but to get Charles to smooth things over with his Danish cousin. But what if a recruiting officer did fail to recruit the force he'd promised, and failed to make it right? We have an example of this in John Gordon of Odlogie. Gordon was the second son of an Aberdeenshire laird, and had been employed by Merkel to help raise the required force for Denmark. He received a portion of Merkel's recruitment grant, and then didn't recruit. Whether he scarpered with the money, or frittered it away, or honestly tried to meet his responsibilities, I can't say. Whatever he did, it was sufficiently serious enough that he was put to the horn, a Scottish expression meaning to be made an outlaw. 
After all, he had been paid a significant amount of money to do a job, and then not done it. Gordon fled, eventually ending up in the German wars anyway. This John Gordon was killed while serving under another John Gordon in 1638. So, with serious legal repercussions awaiting those recruiters who failed to deliver, it's perhaps not surprising that they stooped to such harsh measures to avoid it. However, once these Scottish mercenaries reached the front, they often proved their reputation. Four companies of Mackay's regiment, about 800 strong, under the command of Major Dunbar, resisted a siege by the Count of Tilly, commanding 10,000 men. Despite being vastly outnumbered and running out of ammunition, very few Scots were killed. Tilly, by contrast, lost upwards of 2,000 men. A neighbouring position, held by Germans, was swiftly taken by Habsburg forces, making the Scottish resistance even more impressive by comparison. Afterwards, Mackay's regiment was personally congratulated by two dukes, Mecklenburg and Weimar. Within weeks, Dunbar underwent yet another siege, defending the castle of Breitenberg. Now commanding only 400 men, two companies worth, Dunbar yet again resisted the Count of Tilly. He refused all terms of surrender, and cost the Count another thousand men before the seven-day siege came to an end with the massacre of the defenders and civilians. As Murdoch and Groschon point out, this meant that Dunbar, with only four companies in one case and just two in another, had reduced the army of Tilly from 10,000 to 7,000, killing almost four soldiers for every Scot. That this was THE Count of Tilly, General Field Marshal of the Catholic League, and victor at White Mountain and many other engagements, only made this more impressive, and more effective propaganda. Mackay's regiment repeatedly earned a reputation for discipline and valour far beyond their allies. At Oldenburg, the Scots held a pass for nine hours while their allies retreated. At Holstein, the Scots refused to surrender and escaped to fight another day, while their German comrades surrendered and switched sides. These acts earned the Danish king's praise, and he wrote to his cousin, These soldiers of the Scottish nation, whom we have employed, have served us so faithfully, that if we could obtain more from your majesty, we would most willingly accept them. However, the Scots were not invincible, and their reputation almost became a hindrance. Mackay's regiment was rarely allowed to recuperate. They were too effective. They led the assault on the island of Fermain, though yet again their success was not rewarded with garrison duty where they could recover. Another fight awaited. By the time Denmark left the war in May 1629 with the Treaty of Lübeck, 12,000 Scots had been squandered out of almost 14,000. All this is to say that Scots were a prevalent sight on the battlefields of Europe. For the duration of Denmark's involvement in the war, Scots officers outnumbered their Danish and Norwegian counterparts by more than three to one. Scots didn't only serve in Protestant forces. There was, of course, the Garde Écossaise who served the Catholic French king, but Scots could and did serve the Habsburgs. Take, for example, Walter Leslie. Walter Leslie came from Aberdeenshire, and he was one of multiple members of that family who fought in the Thirty Years' War. He was a Calvinist who had fought on the side of the Dutch in 1624, and with either the Swedish or the Danish at Stralsund in 1628. However, by 1630, he had switched sides, and was serving with the Habsburgs in the Mantuan succession. Why Walter Leslie made this switch, I can't tell. He might have been captured, or been offered better pay, or simply not transferred his service from the Danes to the Swedes like many of his comrades. In either case, he was far from the only one. In his memoirs, one Scot, James Turner, commented on this attitude to allegiance. I had swallowed without chewing, in Germany, a very dangerous maxim, which military men there too much follow, which was, that so we serve our master honestly, it is no matter what master we serve. Despite his Presbyterianism, he and other Scottish Protestants were quite prepared to fight for Catholic rulers 
against their co-religionists and their countrymen. Leslie, alongside fellow Presbyterian Scot John Gordon, led a Scottish-Irish regiment of musketeers in the siege of Nuremberg, where Gustavus Adolphus had holed up. During the Swedish breakout, both Gordon and Leslie were captured. Despite their apparent switching of sides, there doesn't seem to have been much ill will. Colonel Robert Munro, who we met earlier, described the Scottish officers being merry as friends, and the Scottish and Irish conduct on the field of battle won praise from Gustavus himself, even when they'd been trying to kill him. After his release, Leslie continued to win praise and responsibility from his Habsburg commanders, while remaining a Presbyterian until at least 1634. He, along with Gordon and other Irish and Scottish officers, won the trust of their commander, Albrecht von Wallenstein. They also won the trust of the Emperor, Ferdinand II, who did not trust Wallenstein. For a whole host of reasons, including fears that Wallenstein was about to defect to the Swedes, Ferdinand ordered his Generalissimo assassinated. And who better to carry it out than Leslie, Gordon, and their comrades? Wallenstein was escorted to Eger Castle by Colonel Butler, an Irish officer in league with Gordon and Leslie. Importantly, Eger Castle was garrisoned with Irish and Scottish dragoons loyal to Leslie, while the bulk of the forces loyal to Wallenstein camped outside the walls. The conspirators declared that they should have a feast to celebrate their beloved commander, and invited the officers to attend. Wallenstein himself begged off due to illness, but his most loyal and highest-ranking subordinates happily came to dine with their comrades. At this banquet, the wine flowed with toast after toast, which praised the courage of Wallenstein and mocking the emperor for his foolishness. When it came to dessert, a signal was passed between the conspirators. The drawbridge into the castle was raised, and the doors to the banqueting hall opened. A number of Scottish and Irish dragoons entered, fully armed and fully armoured, and Leslie, Gordon and Butler stood and drew their swords. Cheering the name of the Emperor, the conspirators fell on the Loyalists and slaughtered them. The Loyalists, despite being surprised and very drunk, fought back and hard enough to wound Leslie, but they were nevertheless overwhelmed. One officer, Trishka, fought his way out of the banquet hall, only to find himself in the sights of a squad of musketeers who gunned him down. With the die now cast, the conspirators marched to Wallenstein's quarters. Here, another Irish mercenary, Walter Devereux, broke down the door. Wallenstein, who had somehow slept through the earlier massacre, begged for quarter. Devereux rammed his halberd through his former commander. The assassins were richly rewarded. Wallenstein had been secretly condemned to death in Vienna as a traitor, and there was a paper trail ordering his execution, which was published after the fact. Leslie became Imperial Chamberlain, and was granted command of two regiments. At this point, Leslie did convert to Catholicism, but the trust, the fiercely, zealously Catholic Ferdinand placed in the hands of these heretic mercenaries, is telling. And yet again, another example of how the Thirty Years' War was not simply a clash of religions. Before we leave this Leslie behind, to further muddy the waters of allegiance, despite Leslie's subsequent switching of sides, his promotion within Habsburg service, and his conversion to Catholicism, Leslie still held significant loyalty to the Stuart dynasty. He contributed what he could diplomatically to restore the Palatinate to the heirs of Frederick V and his wife and queen, Elizabeth Stuart, the sister of Charles I. I won't cover the rest of the Scottish role in the Thirty Years' War. Check out When Diplomacy Fails for a thorough series on it. However, I should say that Mackay's regiment stuck around, and most switched their service to Sweden. When Gustavus Adolphus lands in Pomerania, a quarter of his 12,000-strong army would be Scottish. Mackay's regiment was not the only Scottish element, but they again proved themselves with their role in capturing Stettin. The Marquess of Hamilton would soon arrive with his own Scottish contingent, which was part of a larger British force. 
Scots would play key roles in the Lion of the North's victory at Brighton Feld. 2,000 Scottish musketeers filled a gap made by retreating Saxon allies before forming into three lines and firing into unison into the enemy. This mass volley destroyed the formation of the opposing ranks, and the musketeers then charged, backed by Swedish cavalry. The Scots consolidated into the enemy artillery and seized it. On a macro level, Gustavus Adolphus's military reforms and his overall strategy was of course central to this success. However, when half your army ups and runs, the initiative of your subordinates is vital, and the Scots and the Swedes seized that initiative. In the aftermath, many Scots officers were promoted, and the Scottish forces were publicly praised by the king. Scottish forces also served alongside their English neighbours in the Netherlands. For example, the British forces aided in the capture of Maastricht from Habsburg control. While Hamilton would return to his king in October 1632, many Scots would remain, including Alexander Leslie. And we'll hear all about Alexander Leslie next episode. Next time, we will begin the First Bishop's War, the first of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Thank you to my royal favourites, Andrew Shoemaker and Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, and the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner. Since the last narrative episode a few weeks ago, the House of Lords has expanded quite a lot, so please join me in welcoming my new nobility, the Marquess of Winchester, Christian Sebast, the Countess of Transylvania, Iwana Azamfire, the Earl of Connacht, John Kelly, the Earl of Westmoreland, James Thompson, the Earl of Scarborough, Jeff Bella, the Earl of Coventry, Liam Hunter, Edward, Viscount Oliferovich, Vigard, Viscount Blindheim, Philip, Viscount Iden, Mehmet, Viscount Baron, Viscount Kevin, Daniel, Viscount Schmidt, and Baron David Hecht. You can join their ranks, of course, by going to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every patron gets an ad-free feed, and patrons of a certain rank get bonus episodes. If you haven't done so already, please consider leaving a review or a rating on iTunes or whichever podcast app you use. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook, at Britannica Pax on Twitter, and just Pax Britannica on Facebook. Thank you to my entire House of Lords, especially those I didn't name, to Sounds Like an Earful for the music used in today's episode, and of course, as always, to you for listening. <laughs>